Not even God is going to stop me doing what I'm going to do to you. I know where your parents live and I know you have a dog. I'm going to stab it. That's a threat that the police allege was made by a notorious bikey who for legal reasons we can't name, so we're just going to call him Tony K. Police allege he made this threat over the phone to plumber Stephen Toy back in March of 2009. What was alleged by police to have happened in the weeks after this threat was made is absolutely, for lack of better words, insane. If you follow the people, the money and the companies that were all connected to Tony K and this threat, and you follow them for years down the line, what you'll find is a web of disturbing connections to some of the most senior political and senior business figures in Australia. This is a story about the kings of Sydney's property development industry and attempt to make sense of their coronation. The following information has been gleaned from court documents and police statements friendly Geordies has viewed, namely from police statements of Stephen Toy, a self-employed plumber from Western Sydney. We'll begin in 2009 when Stephen Toy, then age 27, alleges he was friends with a man by the name of Andy Nahas. Andy Nahas at the time was a 20 year old man from Maryland's. His family had been in the property development business for quite some time, running the Haas Constructions. Stephen claims that he knows Andy from growing up around the Guildford and Maryland's area and that he also went to school with one of Andy's older brothers, either Joe or Fadi Nahas. Joe, who also goes by the name of Yusuf, was director of Nahas Constructions at the time. We'll get to that company soon. Anyway, the police statements given by Stephen Toy detail this strange story wherein Andy is owed money around $4,500 by some man who is unidentified in the first statement, but in the second is referred only to as Andrew. The lack of $4,500 forces Andy to borrow $1,000 from a different unnamed man. Stephen, being the good friend he is, realises his mate knows Andrew's older brother, so he approaches that mate to see if he can get him to convince Andrew to give Andy back the $4,500 that Andy lent. You following? Yeah, look, it's an extremely convoluted chain of debts that doesn't really make that much sense. And in all honesty, I don't think it's entirely true, but just keep following, it's worth it. Stephen's mate does approach Andrew and Andrew pays Stephen's mate the $4,500, presumably under the pretext that that money will go back to Andy. Once the money is paid, Stephen calls his mate, who apparently says that he's just gonna keep the money for himself and not give it to Andy to who it is owed. Thus, Stephen, being the good friend that he is, claims that he began to give Andy a couple of hundred dollars here and there to help him out. Here's the statement. I agreed to help Nahas by giving him money when I had spare. Over the next three months, I continually gave Nahas in approximately $300 amounts. During this period, Nahas continually told me he had no money and he owed people money. And it wasn't right when the male kept his $4,500 from Andrew. I'm sorry, but when did normal people involve such a large number of intermediaries when chasing a few thousand dollars worth of debts? This story is just odd, but here's where it gets odder. Stephen begins receiving phone calls from a man that on his first police statement, he refused to identify, figuring that it's the man that Andy Nahas owes a thousand dollars to. The first call is on the 19th of March. He's an expert from Stephen's first police statement. About a month later, out of the blue, I got a phone call on my work phone. The number display on my phone said private number. I answered and it was a male. He said, how are you going, Stephen? I said to the male on the phone, I'm fine. What is this regarding? The male on the phone said, it's about the money you owe Andy Nahas, because Andy owes me money. I said to the male on the phone, it's between me and Andy. We've already worked it out amongst us. The male on the phone said, nah, you have to come and see me because Andy owes me money and you owe him money. So now he has to pay and you have to pay. I thought this may have been male number three who Andy owed a thousand dollars to. I said to the male on the phone, by chance, how much does he owe you? The male on the phone said $10,000. I said to the male on the phone, that's bullshit. What happens between me and Andy is between us. We're friends. What happens between you and Andy is between you and Andy. The male on the phone said, I expect you to come and see me. Don't disrespect me. I hung up the phone, terminating the call. I did not recognize the voice of the caller. However, he did recognize the voice of the caller as it's revealed in Stephen's second police statement. Not only did he recognize the voice of the caller, but the caller identified himself as a man that Stephen knew, Bandito's bikey, Tony K. Needless to say, the recount of this call in the second statement that Stephen gave is a lot more interesting. I answered the phone and a male person said, yeah, Steve, it's Tony K with you, brother. I said, yeah, mate, how can I help you? Tony said, I need you to come and see me. I said, what for? Tony said, it's got to do with Andy Nahas and some money. I said, mate, whatever got to do with me and Andy Nahas and money has to do with us. It has nothing to do with you. 
Tony said, Andy has been lying to me and he owes money and he hasn't told me the truth for a long time and I'm very upset with him. I'm going to speak with his brothers so I can get the money off them. I said, fair enough. I've got no money to give you. It has nothing to do with me. Tony said, I'm at my mother's house in Guildford. Come and see me. I said, what for? I have no reason to come and see you. I'm busy, mate. Tony said, I'm showing you respect. So you should show me respect and come and see me. I said, I'll see what I can do in the next few days. In this second statement, Stephen also claims that he'd seen Tony Kay around the Marylands area, had family connection to him, and also knew him from when he used to work security at the Pink Pepper Lounge in Parramatta, where he'd see him with a man that for legal reasons will call Charlie D. The reason as to why Stephen did not identify Tony on his first statement could be somewhat related to the last few lines of his second statement. I truly think that they would hurt or kill me and my family. They already hurt me so badly I thought I was going to die. And this is why I am truly fearful for my life and my families. Yeah, we'll get back to that later. Back to where we were though, it's then claimed in the days following this phone call, Stephen received numerous calls from a private number, which he didn't answer as he believed them to be from Tony Kay. This was until around the 23rd of March of 2009, when the police and Stephen alleged that Tony Kay rang Stephen's personal mobile, a number which Stephen claims only his mother, father, brother-in-law, sister, and a couple of close friends, including Andy the Hass, possessed. Stephen's second statement reads as follows. I received a phone call on my personal phone. There was a number displayed on the screen, but I did not recognize the number. I answered the call. The mail said, it's Tony, what's happening? How come you haven't come to see me? I recognize this voice to be the same voice of the male who called me the first time identifying himself as Tony K. I said, mate, I don't have time for your shit. Tony said, where are you now? I will come and see you. I said, no mate, nup. Tony said, not even God is going to stop me doing what I'm going to do to you. I know where your parents live and I know you have a dog. I'm going to stab it. I said, okay, mate, no worries. Are you finished? Tony said in Arabic, I'm going to f your God. I said, no worries, mate. I could hear a male voice in the background say, we're going to your parents' house. We'll see you there. I hung up the phone. About a week later, I went to visit my parents at the service station. I bumped into a friend who told me Tony K was in hospital. He had been in a car accident. Because I hadn't heard from Tony, I realized this must have been why. Then there's a rather large time gap between this and the next incident in this statement. It doesn't really detail any alarmed conversation Stephen might have had. I guess he could have just been relaxed about some bike he f***ing his god. According to the statements, the next event occurs on Thursday the 15th of April. Stephen goes to work at his friend's house at Rydalmere and throughout the day he receives numerous calls from Andy Nahas. About 1.30pm the same day I saw a missed call on my personal mobile telephone from Andy Nahas. I called him back, Nahas answered and asked what time I finished work. I said not sure, probably 3.30, 4 o'clock. Nahas said okay, what time will you be able to come and see me? I said I will ring you when I'm free. The call ended about 3.30 p.m. The same day I received a call from Nahas. I answered and Nahas said, what do you reckon the absolute latest is that you'll be able to come and see me? I said, I'm not sure, mate. Nahas said, what do you reckon about seven? I said, I don't, probably earlier. The call ended. About 5.30 p.m. I received another call from Nahas. At this time, I was at another mate's house. Nahas said, how long are you gonna be? I am in Guildford. I need to see you. We need to sort the money out. I said, just after six o'clock, I'm busy. The call ended. About 6 p.m., I received another call from Nahas. I answered. Nahas said, I'm at Red Rooster. Can you come see me? I said, mate, give me 10 minutes and I will be there. I left my mate's house and I drove to the Red Rooster at Guildford. This is around where the statement takes a violent and dramatic twist. Stephen borrows his mate's van, drives to Red Rooster. And well, again, there's very little point in doing anything other than reading the second statement. When I pulled into the driveway, I saw Andy Nahas in his car. It is a silver colored Toyota Camry Sportivo. Nahas was in the front passenger seat. Another male was in the driver's seat. There was another male in the back seat. I think they are uni friends of Nahas. I parked the van next to his Camry and spoke with him through the window. Nahas got out of the car and came to my window. Nahas said, look, what are you doing? I said, I have to go load the van. I need at least an hour and then I'll meet you. Nahas said, okay, okay. At this time, a black Commodore drove into the car park. Nahas said, look, there's Sarge's car. The Commodore had very dark tinted windows and I could not see inside. It parked on an angle about three meters from the rear passenger side of my van. I turned my head to the left and I saw all four doors of the Commodore open. Four males got out of each door and ran to my van. At this stage, I only recognized Tony K. He ran to the passenger side of my van. Tony is about 22 years old. 
He is Middle Eastern appearance and is skinny. He is very tall, about six foot two. He's about my height, but because he's slim, he looks really tall. He was clean shaven and looks really baby faced. He looks to me like a kid. He was wearing gray colored three quarter pants, white colored Nike shoes, a dark colored hat, either Nike or G-Star and a gray and horizontal striped hoodie. The hood was on his head covering the hat. As he was running towards the car, he held the front of his jumper up and I could see a Glock. The Glock was black, but looked badly scratched. Tony pulled the Glock out of the front of his pants and I watched as he cocked the gun. This all happened in a matter of seconds. One of the males opened the passenger door. It would have opened about 30 centimeters. I leant over and pulled the door shut and locked it. I sped off. I drove out of the car park and turned left. I'm not sure what street I turned onto, but it is the same street that Guilford Club is on. I looked in my rear vision mirrors and I saw the males run back to the black Commodore. They sped out of the car park behind me. On this road, the black Commodore overtook me just as the round meets Marion Street. I tried to turn left, but the Commodore pulled in front of me and I could not continue driving without running into the car. Tony K got out of the rear passenger seat. He ran towards the van with his shirt up and I could again see the pistol. Tony ran toward the driver's side. I reversed backwards about 10 meters. I put the car back in first gear and drove back towards the roundabout. I drove straight through the roundabout and turned right at the Guilford Bowling Club. I drove all the way to Maryland's Road. I again looked in my rear view mirror and rear vision mirror and I saw Andy Nahas's silver Camry speeding up behind me. I went to turn right onto Maryland's Road. The silver Camry forced me onto the wrong side of the road and then they got jammed behind a median strip. I kept driving towards a roundabout. I turned left at that roundabout. Granville Park was on my right hand side. I then saw the silver Camry drive up again behind me. I continued driving over a bridge that goes over the railway tracks. There were cars lined up at the traffic lights. I drove around the cars and through the red light and turned left onto Pitt Street. The Camry was still chasing me. On Pitt Street, the Camry overtook me. As it did, I turned right into a one-way street and the Camry had no choice but to keep going. At the end of the one-way street, I turned right into McFarland Street and drove past Maryland's RTA. This car chase appears to be verified by the police as in their statement it claims that CCTV footage from Maryland's railway station depicts a white van on the wrong side of the road followed closely by a silver sedan. At this point, Stephen believes he's lost his pursuers which include Andy Nahas, Tony Kay and a few other men. So he apparently drives the van to its owner's grandmother's house in Greystains. When he gets out, there's no one home, so he leaves the keys in the letterbox and walks down the road. Now, poor Stephen has really bad luck because apparently as he got to a road just down from the house, Andy Nahas' silver Sportivo pulls up. Tony K, Andy Nahas, a bloke by the name of Olsen and another male got out of the car. At this point in the statement, we get to the obligatory near forensic description of what brand of clothes each of the men were wearing. Nike Air Maxes seems to be a favorite, but as interesting as scallywag attire might be, the next section of the statement is far better. I got into a verbal argument with Tony and Olsen. We were yelling at one another. I remember him saying it was no longer about the money, it was about principle, and I'd made Tony look like a gronk. Olsen walked towards me and I shaped up and got ready to fight. Tony pulled the Glock out of the front of his pants and cocked it back. Tony said, give me your phones. I handed Tony my personal mobile telephone. Tony and Olsen then grabbed me and pushed me into the back seat of the car. I was sitting in the center of the back seat and Tony was sitting on one side and Olsen was on the other. They were yelling at Nahas saying, get f***ed. We will return the car when we feel like it. Got into the driver's seat and the other male got into the front passenger seat drove off and Nahas was left on the side of the road. One of them put a jumper over my head and forced me to lean down forward. I don't know which one it was. Whilst my head was down, I was repeatedly smashed in the face and head. I immediately felt severe pain in my head. The car drove for about 15 minutes. I was assaulted the whole time whilst the car was moving. I do not know who was assaulting me as my head was covered. I felt the car pull into the driveway. Moments later, the car stopped and I heard all four doors open. One of the males said, shut up, don't say a word, put your head down. Someone tried to pull me out of the right hand side of the car. I hung onto the center console. I didn't want to get out. I eventually turned my body and tried to get out. I put my right leg out the door. When I put my left leg out, I felt someone grab it and twist my left foot inwards. This was extremely painful and I thought my leg was going to break. As they were twisting my leg, I turned onto my stomach and crawled out of the car. 
Keep in mind, these are just details from Stephen's second statement. In his first, he details being stabbed in the car, but we'll continue. I ended up lying face down on what I believe was a concrete driveway. The concrete was light gray in color. It looked like old concrete. One male said, get up, get up. I did, and they walked me into the garage. My head was still down and covered. I could only see the ground. Stephen's statement then alleges that he's repeatedly assaulted and then threatened and held against his will in this garage. I could slightly see through a gap. Olsen in front of me, he punched me in the face and I immediately put my hands up in defense. He said, put your hands down. I put them down. Olsen swung again and punched in the face and I put my hands up. I remember he was breathing heavy. I then started to be repeatedly assaulted again by Olsen. Only now he was using a four by two wooden plank. It was painted a very light gray blue color. He was hitting to my face and arms. During this time, I saw Charlie D. He was with Tony and Olsen was still in the garage. I know Charlie D through work when I was in security. He had caused a problem at one of the clubs I was working at in 2007. Tony, Charlie and Olsen had a conversation. I heard one of them say, what are we going to do with him? I heard Charlie say, just cut him up and chuck him in the river. Everyone left me for a short time in the garage alone. Moments later, Olsen came back in and tied my hands and feet with cable ties and then gaffer tape tapes around the ties. Olsen then punched me in the right eye. I knew I was bleeding because I felt blood run down my face. He then punched me in the left eye and I felt immediate pain. I saw stars. He left me sitting on the ground, now with my hands and feet tied and the cover was now off my head. I think it just fell off. Olsen turned the light out walked out of the garage and pulled down the roller door. I heard a padlock lock on the outside. Sometime later, the roller door opened and walked in. He was alone, was carrying a bottle of water, came over to me and helped me have a drink. As my hands were tied, I could not hold the bottle. So he held it to my mouth and tipped water in. I could see the bottle was the Fiji brand and was a rectangular bottle. It was clear and the water inside was ice cold like it was straight out of the fridge carrying a torch or something so he did not turn the light on he said are you all right i said no i'm f***ed. left the bottle beside me in the garage and left closing the roller door again behind him sometime later approximately half an hour the roller door opened and olsen and charlie walked in they turned the light on one of them said get up get up they helped me to my feet and set me on a chair the same chair I described in my other statement. They tied my body to the chair. My arms were also tied to the back of the chair around my elbows. My hands were left cable tied and gaffer tapes. However, they cut my feet and re-cable tied them to the legs of the chair. They left the garage, turning off the light and closing the garage door again. My version from here is exactly as I stated in my original statement. However, at some stage, I believe it was the following day, Tony K came into the garage and he was with his cousin. I know of Tony's cousin through working at clubs. Andy Nahas has also mentioned him. I've seen him before, however, never spoken with him. Charlie D was with them. They were in the garage with me for about 20 minutes. And during this time, Tony K stood on my face and continually told me, don't look up. The other two were saying stuff, but I don't remember what they were saying. At one stage, I was lying on my side and Tony was standing on my face. Tony said, go and get the bolt cutters. We're gonna cut your toes off and send them to your mum. I screamed, no, 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 no. And I started kicking and moving. Tony K said, okay, we won't do that. We will cut your finger off and send it to your mum. You won't bleed though, because we will burn the metal and hold it where we cut your finger off and it will stop the bleeding. Tony K then said, look up. I could see he was holding a piece of sponge. It was like greeny color and it looked like an underlay. He said, put this in your mouth so you don't scream when we cut your finger off. I could see Tony K was holding a pair of garden shears and had them open around my left thumb. I thought he was gonna cut my left thumb off. He just stopped and let me go. Tony K then said, you have two options. You can either let me shoot you in both of your knees and we will drop you off at the hospital and let you go, or you can think of who is gonna come up with $50,000 for us. I said, I don't know who's gonna have that kind of money, mate, and I don't have my phone and can't go through it. Tony K said, well, think of someone and I'll leave you here for a few hours. You are a waste of time and having you here is a risk because people will start to know. 
Stephen's first statement then details multiple phone calls between him and his mother in a desperate attempt to raise the 50K. Seemingly after these fail, one of these men gets spooked and releases Stephen, but only after he spent a night locked up in the garage. In his first statement, Stephen, like he did with Tony, refuses to identify this man, but his second statement reads as follows. Was the person who took me home. There was no one else there that day. The reason I did not tell the police this part of my version when I first made my statement was because I'm extremely scared of these people. During the time they held me, they repeatedly told me that if I told police or anyone went to the police, that I'd be dead. No one would ever find me and they would do the same to my family, what they did to me. They had people on standby to do it. From this experience, I believed this to be true. I truly think that they would hurt or kill me and my family. They already hurt me so badly I thought I was going to die. And this is why I am truly fearful for my life and my families. I am so scared that they will do more bad. They know where my family live. Since the incident, I have been in hiding because I'm scared they will come and kill me. After being released by Stephen goes to his parents' house, then immediately to hospital where he's treated for broken left eye socket, head trauma, severe bruising to face and eyes, stab wound to the left side of his chest, cut to his right eyebrow, severe bruising to both his arms, constant headache, chipped front lower teeth, severe swelling to face, eyes, neck and arms. But the ordeal apparently isn't over for Stephen as police alleged that whilst he was being treated in hospital, a group of men came looking for him. The police statement reads as follows. While Stephen Toy was at Westmead Hospital, Mustafa Jouad, Tony Kay, and another male separately entered the emergency reception area of Westmead Hospital. CCTV footage obtained from the hospital depicts Jouad, Tony and in the foyer of the emergency ward. At one point, all three meet up and sit in a group on provided chairs. At various points, is seen to approach the reception desk. On one occasion, Tony is present at the reception desk with him. CCTV depicts Juard gaining access to the ward while Stephen's mother was in the ward waiting for the complainant who had been taken for a CT scan. She indicates that a male matching the description of Juard walked down the aisle and seemed to be looking into each separate bed area. He looked like he was trying to find someone. She heard him speak to a nurse and say, that guy that has been bored in and was bashed in the last two days, can you tell me what his first name is? She reports that the nurse said surname and the response was no first name. The nurse said, you'll have to go to the front desk. Stephen's mother reports that the nurse told her that there had been an inquiry about her son. Stephen's mother asked her to find out their name and who they claimed to be. She indicated that a short time later, one of the administration spoke to her and indicated that there had been a man saying his name was and he was Stephen's brother-in-law. The complainant was made anonymous for hospital purposes. Stephen then makes the two statements to the police, one on the 18th of April and the other on the 24th. The second one I just read the bulk of. This seemingly leads the police to wiretap the phones of the accused. On the 9th of May, Stephen Toy takes Andy Nahas the following. You had nothing to do with it. I told I had seen you before I was going to my mum's house and then I drove off and then stopped to make a call. Then I got bashed and robbed. And when I was in hospital, they thought I was a bikey and everything. I'm not. I just told them I got bashed and robbed, bro. I didn't mean to put you in. I told them it had nothing to do with you. I just seen you quickly before it happened. That's it. I was full f in hospital on morphine and I had three detectives screaming at me, bro. I gave them the biggest blow ass story, man. I'm sorry that they busted your balls. The police statement also detailed phone calls, lawfully intercepted telephone communications, recorded extensive phone conversations slash SMS messages between Andy Nahas and Stephen Toy in relation to the kidnapping. Further conversations slash SMS contact was then had between Andy Nahas and Tony Kay. On one occasion, 9th of May 2009, during an exchange of a number of SMS messages between Andy Nahas and Stephen Toy about the offence, Stephen Toy indicated that he is interstate. Andy Nahas called Tony Kay and relayed the information from the SMS messages. During this call, Andy Nahas refers to Stephen Toy as that bitch and that girl. He also tells Tony Kay he reckons he is interstate. Tony Kay says, where's interstate? Andy Nahas says words to the effect of, I don't know, we're f going on a holiday, cuz. Tony Kay says, all right, bye. Conversations have also been intercepted between Andy Nahas and 
Three days later on the 12th of May, about 20 heavily armed police raid the homes of Tony Kay and three other suspects, arresting and charging Tony Kay, Andy Nahas and Olsen with kidnapping offences. I believe all were denied bail apart from Andy Nahas, who was released on a $25,000 bond paid for by his brother Joe Nahas. Along with the bond, Andy's bail conditions included report daily to police at Maryland's, surrender passport to register at Liverpool local court, do not apply for any travel docs or approach any points of departure from Australia, not approach or contact any co-offenders, victim or witnesses or cause anyone else to, and a non-association order with any members of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. On the face of it, this ordeal appears to be a pretty slam dunk case for the cops. You've got a witness, phone taps, CCTV footage, but what happens just a month later appears to derail the entire case. On the 15th of June 2009, the police receive a letter from Stephen Toy's lawyer advising them that Stephen no longer wish to be a witness. It reads as follows. Dear Detective Sergeant Woods, re Stephen Toy. We've been instructed to advise and represent Mr. Toy in relation to an investigation which we understand is currently being conducted by you and by other members of the gang squad. We understand the police spoke to our client on or about the 17th of April when our client was a patient at Westmead Hospital. Certain allegations were apparently made by our client at that time, although at that time we understand no person was identified by it. We were also instructed that on a subsequent occasion our client was spoken to at a police station. At that time, further information was provided by our client to police in which persons were apparently named by him. We are instructed that our client has serious reservations and concerns of the accuracy of the information he provided to police. He instructs us that he is uncertain about the accuracy of allegations he has made, particularly as he was under a regime of medication on both occasions following prescription by hospital medical staff which includes sedatives and painkilling medication in addition to antibiotics. Our client is not able to provide details of precise details of medication, but no doubt the hospital records would confirm the details if necessary. Our client instructs us that he does not wish to pursue any allegations he may have made, nor does he wish to participate in any other interview by police, nor does he wish to become embroiled in any criminal prosecution as a witness. Our client wishes to resume his normal day-to-day -day life without being subjected to the pressure inherent in criminal proceedings over which he has no control, and in which allegations he has made which are unreliable to say the least, given his previous medical condition will be relied upon to prosecute other people. In these circumstances, our client has instructed us that he does not wish to be approached by police. If there are any further matters which the police wish to take up with our client, he requests that these be directed to this firm. Subject to any advice by this firm, to the contrary, our client will not agree to be questioned directly. We look forward to receiving your confirmation that police will respect the wishes of our client. Yours faithfully, Chris Watson, Watson Solicitors. Odd. Police then get a forensic scientist and basically state, no, antibiotics are not magic mushrooms. They don't change your memory, quote. Their medication he was taking or prescribed would not have caused him to give inaccurate information to police or be uncertain of events which are described in Mr. Toy's statements. However, he was allegedly kidnapped and assaulted, which would be expected to have a traumatizing effect and may affect memory. Various legal skirmishes ensue over the following months. In December 2009, Andy Nahas's lawyers flagged their intention to cross-examine Stephen Toy. Keeping in mind, this is months after Stephen's lawyer had stated to the police that Stephen no longer wished to be a witness. The Department of Public Prosecutions agreed to cross-examination, yet there's a question as to if the hearing will even happen, as the key witness is not supporting the prosecutions. And there are very little documents we've managed to view really until August and September of 2010. The most interesting one being this one dated the 6th of September 2010, where a police officer from the gang squad makes the following statement. Between the 2nd of August and 6th of September 2010, I made numerous attempts to locate Stephen Toy, including attending his last known premises. Every time I attended these premises, no persons were home. On the 6th of August 2010, I attended the last known address for Toy's solicitor. No persons were at this address. I then contacted the mobile telephone number for this service. No person answered. And there was no message service for a message to be left. I then got in contact with Decran Yakinian, Toy's last known solicitor, who stated to police that he had not spoken with Toy in some months and no longer had his contact details. Yakinian was going to try and get his details from a friend of Toy who still was in contact with Yakinian. 
From this date, I've been unable to get in contact with Yakinian. The mobile telephone rings out and there's no message service. On Monday the 30th of August, I spoke with a source who stated that Toy was now friends with Tony Kay and would not be attending court even if he was issued with a subpoena. The source stated that Toy would rather be charged and sent to jail himself before attending to give evidence as a witness. Inquiries relating to the medical records and tax records have both been made and neither assisted in locating Stephen Toy. He disappeared. Police couldn't find Stephen. Fun fact, Toy's last known solicitor, Decran Yakenian, you know, the one the police also couldn't contact, he had a professional misconduct finding held against him in 2019 for various reasons, including misleading a court. And the same day this statement is made by the police, the charges against Andy Nahas are dismissed. I believe it's the same for his co-accused. But it gets better for Andy and co, as not only are the charges dropped, the Department of Public Prosecutions pays for their legal costs. Andy gets over 30k. Oh, but Andy was lucky already because according to documents viewed by Friendly Geordies, Nahas Constructions, the firm run by his family, was already paying his legal costs. That might explain why they were using Doyle's construction lawyers in a serious criminal matter. What a story as it is. An alleged violent kidnapping, police raids, phone taps, a witness seemingly disappearing. It's like the end of season one of The Wire. But to get to the real heart of this story, you have to see what the accused got up to in the 12 years following this ordeal. Tony Kay, up until recently, ran a construction business creatively titled Kay Constructions. He remained squarely in the eye line of cops in the years after the kidnapping charges, chiefly for an unsolved 2009 murder, an alleged murder that took place just months before the alleged kidnapping. No wonder Stephen was scared. For over a decade, this murder has gone unsolved and no perpetrator was arrested. Earlier this year, Tony Kay was charged with the murder, but who and what are the political connections to the people involved in this ordeal? Well, Andy Nahas also stayed in the construction industry, eventually becoming the secretary of a large property development group, Coronation Property in 2016. Any guesses who Coronation Property hired as their executive director earlier this year? Yeah, it's John Barillaro. Again. Yes, bruz. Announcing that he was working for Coronation, the company that Andy Nahas, the guy police unsuccessfully alleged was a kidnapper, worked for as well, Barillaro grandly proclaimed, It's rare in life to come across an opportunity where the vision excites you and the passion of the individuals behind the name is so infectious that it captures you. Let me introduce to you, Hashtag Coronation Property. My next chapter begins. He just has an eloquent way with words. But what a short chapter that was. Not as short as the one that followed it. John goes to New York from February this year, right up until he got his trade commissioner role. Well, right up until he thought he got the trade commissioner role. John Barillaro worked as the executive director of Coronation Property, the property development company run by the Nahas family. And the secretary at the time was our friend and co-star of the story that you just heard, Andy Nahas. Coronation Property is the company that grew from the ashes of Nahas Constructions, the company that paid for Andy's legal costs. Both have been directed by Andy's brother Joe Nahas, or Yusuf Nahas as he sometimes goes by. Nahas Constructions connections to this alleged kidnapping are at the very least bizarre. Police claimed that the phone calls that took place when Stephen was kidnapped between him and his mother, where he demanded $50,000 for Tony Kay, you know, in exchange for not being chopped up and thrown in the river, those calls were made on a phone that was subscribed to a provider by Nahas Constructions. By the way, they also allege that one of the co-accused was employed by Nahas Constructions. I believe at some point, the police allege that Tony Kay was also employed by Nahas Constructions. But statutory declarations submitted by Joe and Fadi Nahas of Nahas Constructions vigorously disputed that claim. Alleged bikey connections aside, the political and business connections of Nahas Constructions from around the time are compelling. Nahas Constructions donated $13,950 to the Liberal Party in 2010, leading up to the 2011 election. They also used to be the goalpost sponsor of the Parramatta Eels. 
In fact, it had been previously reported by the Sydney Morning Herald that director Jonah Hass in 2010 had facilitated an introduction between a Parramatta power broker and a member of the Obeid family. Coincidentally, in 2016, Tony K made headlines after Parramatta Eels footballer Corey Norman and junior Palo and Penrith Panthers James Sagiaro were photographed dining with him and members of the alleged Alabadine crime family at Golden Century Restaurant. Later in the night, Norman was caught in possession of drugs at Star Casino. The footballers were issued warnings by police for consorting with criminals. But back to what happened in the Hass constructions. Well, as the Obeds well and truly found out, all good things must come to an end. And in 2012, Nahas Constructions went bust, leaving a trail of subcontractors chasing up unpaid debts. In fact, one subcontractor, Bluestone, blamed Nahas Constructions' alleged failure to pay them for their work for their demise. Things obviously got pretty desperate as it was reported in 2013 that standover man and Mick Gatto associate Alex Tallul was employed by desperate contractors to chase debts from Nahas Constructions. It wasn't looking good for the Nahas family business. Kate McClymont reported in October 2012, Joe Nahas, who also goes by Yusuf Nahas, listed himself as unemployed on his personal insolvency agreement. This allows a debtor to come to an agreement with creditors to settle debts without becoming bankrupt. Yet only about a year later, as reported by McClymont, in March 2014, he became a director of Coronation, and two months later, Nahas finalised his obligations to creditors, according to corporate records. Like a phoenix from the ashes, Coronation Property rose. Coronation Property is a venture between the Nahas family and corporate lawyer and businessman John Landerer, who along with Joe Nahas became a director. Like the Nahasses, John Landerer is also a Liberal Party donor, donating tens of thousands of dollars to the party over the years, including to the New South Wales fundraising body, the Millennium Forum. You know, the one that got busted accepting mafia donations and set up politicians with developers. With Joe and John as directors, the same Andy Nahas who was charged with kidnapping became a secretary of Coronation in 2016. Friendly Geordies has previously revealed that this is the same year in which Andy was also charged with assaulting a security guard. For this charge, the other director of Coronation Property, an esteemed lawyer John Landerer, provided a character reference for Nahas. How sweet. Where any claims? I have no hesitation in advising my opinion that the offence is a one-off incident, not likely to ever be repeated based on my belief that Mr Nahas is a man of honesty and integrity and proud of his family's high standing in the community. High standing in the community. Hmm. Andy was convicted of that assault, by the way. Don't worry, he was only fined $800. Not much for a man whose family owned $20 million houses. How far he's come since that alleged kidnapping. Plus he's now in good company with ex-executive director John Barillaro's beef with a different type of working man. Coronation really do seem to be his people. I'm saying it now, he shouldn't have quit. They too understand the troubles of dealing with impertinent media. Take a look at these media clips from a few years back. Some of Sydney's biggest developments, millions of dollars, an allegedly stolen Lamborghini, an attempted home invasion and assault. They're the ingredients of a family war being played out right now in a Sydney court between three wealthy brothers. The Nahas family is behind some of our biggest developments, from the paper mill in Liverpool to a luxury tower in Parramatta, not to mention lavish weddings like this. <laughs> Shutting down the City West Link in the months before Salim Mahaj's nuptials made headlines. <laughs> But the cracks started to appear earlier this year in the form of a family feud over millions of dollars. Fadi Nahas on one side claiming the dispute sparked this. CCTV of two unidentified men trying to kick down his front and back doors as his wife and child cowered inside. The cause of the incident, however, remains unknown. Once we're warriors, three of us, we're great at what we've done. It's just fallen apart, deteriorated over money. 
Fadi, who claims he wasn't paid his card of the Coronation Property Company, was accused in court of intimidating the managing director, his brother Joseph, telling him, you are going to pay me my money and it's going to be nothing under $5 million. The court heard he also punched his brother in the face and took his Lamborghini and Range Rover. Fadi doesn't deny those allegations, but says the luxury cars were in lieu of the money he was owed. My client thought he was entitled to a payout and uh, uh, he hadn't got that, so that will be part of his defence. The feud far from over. The hearing will resume later this year. Kelly Fedor, Nine News. Together, they built some of Western Sydney's biggest luxury developments, but tonight the Nahaus family is torn apart. A dispute between brothers landing one in court on criminal charges. It's a decision which brought Fadi Nahas relief, but not much more. I'm very disappointed it came to this. Um, it's, I, don't, I don't see it as a win for anyone. Um, if anything, it's been a humiliation. Allegations he intimidated his elder brother and stole luxury vehicles withdrawn after Joseph Nahas decided he did not want to give evidence. The elder Nahas is the managing director of the Coronation Group behind developments which include the paper mill in Liverpool and a luxury tower in Parramatta. It's that company which Fadi Nahas says they fell out over, admitting he took things too far in March when he confronted Joseph Nahas saying, you don't want to meet up, you dog, before he slapped and punched him. The magistrate accepted the assault came during the ongoing dispute between the brothers. She said this was out of character for a man who did not have a violent record. And so she handed Nahas a $1,500 fine. Families and money are always a problem. Uh, most people would agree with that. Uh, but being able to resolve it uh, is a great outcome. And Fadi Nahas says he'll still pursue the money he claims he's owed. So in, in due course, that will be resolved. Mm, family trouble. Barilaro sure can empathise. These videos appear to be completely scrubbed from the net and were only available from databases, despite only being a few years old. I can't really offer much more information on them, but I wonder who sent those mysterious men to Fadi Nahas's house. Anyway, Remember how Tony K, Andy Nahas's co-accused, was caught hanging out with people who police alleged members of the Alamedine crime family? Well, Friendly Geordies has something exclusive and cool to reveal. Here's a picture of the ex-Deputy Premier's ex-business partner and I guess ex-boss, considering the Nahas family runs Coronation, ex-accused kidnapper Andy Nahas hanging out with the Alamedines. There's Andy, all five feet of him. See that guy? That's Masood Zakaria, an alleged Alamedine heavyweight and now on the run as one of the most wanted men in Australia, wanted over his alleged involvement in a failed attempt to kill Ibrahim Hamzi. A company he directs, Zach Services, is also a shareholder in labour hire business Alpha Omega Enterprises. We asked if Coronation or MM Builders have done any business with Alpha Omega Enterprises. They didn't answer directly. This guy over here, that's Joseph Vokai, alleged leader of the KVT Islander gang that is aligned with the Alamedines. He's currently imprisoned, refused bail over the same failed plot to kill Ibrahim Hamzi. And him, that's John Basari, another Alamedine associate. Earlier this year, he handed himself into police after being wanted alongside Masood and Joseph. He was charged with nine offences, which included the usual drug possession and supply, dealing with proceeds of crime and participating in a criminal group. It's just insane. In just December last year, all three of these men were wanted by the cops, and here they are posing for pictures with the Deputy Premier's business partner. And this guy? That's Ali Yunus the cousin of the alleged head of the snake, Rafat Alamedine. You might know him better as a huncho. What the hell is that? If this picture wasn't good enough, here are some close-ups of a huncho with our guy, Andy Nahas. Coronation property has some associations with really questionable characters. And the Alamedines too. We think this trade commissioner scandal is outrageous, but these are the people that the ex-deputy premier of New South Wales went to work for immediately after leaving office, and the parliamentary ethics advisor approved. 
nobody batted an eye. Apparently the second highest office holder in the state. Parachuting from that job to become a property developer is just fine in New South Wales. It's already been reported that John Barillaro made representations to the building commissioner on behalf of Coronation Property. So watch this space. We put questions to John Landerer, Andy Nahas, Joe Nahas and John Barillaro. Their responses are here. This is just the beginning of an ongoing investigation into Coronation Property. We have more to come, especially pertaining to their dealings with contractors. So if you've had dealings with Coronation, or have any information you wish to share, send it to friendlygeordies at protonmail.com. Stories like this take a large amount of time, resources, legal risk, and just plain risk to produce. If you appreciated today's video and would like to see more long form investigations like it, please become a patron. Links to our Patreon in the description. And you can also click the link here. You can also buy a Fixated Persons Unit t-shirt. And as a final note, I wanna emphasize the size and wealth of Coronation Property Co. This video was the story, or lack thereof more accurately, about the people that ran a bus construction company rising from the ground to be crowned one of Sydney's largest developer families, Coronation Property Co. Their website today reads, with over $5.3 billion in mixed-use projects in the pipeline, Coronation Property story has only just begun. And you know something? I think they're right.